Hello and welcome to IMR's October webinar. It's all well and good to suggest the adoption of predictive maintenance, but in some industries, the question is how? As part of the Smart Eureka project, DDMS, Data Driven Maintenance Services, funded by Enterprise Ireland and the CDTI in Spain, IMR is working with Donlock Precision, Key Plastics, Danobat, IDECO, and Savvy Data Systems, where we are utilizing IIoT to leverage data analytics in order to provide an effective predictive maintenance system for manufacturing companies. We have IMR's machining application specialist, Chris Judge, senior industrial data analytics researcher, Anthony Faustine, and senior IIoT research engineer, Dermot Murphy. And they are all combining their powers and expertise for this morning's presentation. If you have any questions for any of the lads throughout the webinar, please use the question and answers function on the bottom of your screen beside the chat function and we'll get to them at the end if we have time, and if not, we'll get back to you by email. First up, welcome, Chris. Thanks, Gary, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar this morning. Um, we're going to be going through a project that we've been working over the last number of months, a very interesting project, and a lot of very good work by the IMR team in pulling this together. And the project's not finished yet, but there's some very, very interesting findings at the moment, and we'll go through them in, in detail this morning. So first of all, I just want to talk about maintenance and maintenance for manufacturing companies and precision engineering companies and molding companies, which this project has predominantly worked on recently um, and maintenance as we all know is in three or four different forms we have typically a reactive maintenance which is a machine breaks down it's unannounced when it'll happen it just happens machine could be down for a week a day um, and it costs a lot of money to obviously repair and can be very very expensive to repair then we have our preventative maintenance which is moving into the digital domain where we conduct re regular routine checks on the machine to make sure that everything is as it should be and um, to prevent problems for recurring. And then the third type is predictive maintenance, where we're starting to predict future things that are going to fail on the machine. And this incorporates a lot of um, sensors and equipment and temperature, vibration, different types of analysis. So predictive and preventative maintenance have become indispensable parts of industry for um, and machine condition monitoring systems have enabled more accurate ways of determining when a machine is going to um, be down, be out of production, or inconsistent part quality. These are all uh, focused around uh, machine condition monitoring. And they will help to prevent situations where machines are stopped without warning for long periods of time or costly repairs. If we look at digitalization and monitoring of machines typically on a factory floor, you will have either no data, no software, no infrastructure, or you will have machine monitoring, which means we are capturing data and we are doing backward looking reports. As we move into more industry four situations, we start to get into more proactive and predictive and future looking situations and more disruptive technologies that allow us to look more in depth at what's going on in the process and to control it to the to ultimately getting towards um, self-optimizing or self-learning models where machines themselves can correct themselves if they see something um, in the future going to cause problem. Um, for this project here, we focused on two areas for two companies, uh, CNC machining, and just a small bit about CNC machining, it's precision engineering, um, working in mold and dye, medical device, aerospace, um, oil and gas industries. And these CNC machines are very expensive, very advanced pieces of technology that work in the micron area. So these machines will get down to two, three, four microns of accuracy and repeatability, very, very high end precision stuff. When we get into injection molding, then Injection molding, predominantly people view injection molding as molding plastic items that you have on your desk and you have around you. And generally tolerances might not be as critical, but recent times have seen molding move a lot into medical devices as well and in requiring much more tighter tolerance and high repeatability work. Injection molding now will get down into the micron area as well. Very, very accurate, precise work. So the challenge for this project was, and to, at the outset, if we take a look at a micron, how big a micron is, a micron is actually very, very, very small size and scale. So we're talking about microns here. 
the number of things that can influence those microns or the changes in that process, like the environment, you have dust, you have wet, you have temperature, like a two degree change in temperature on a factory floor can affect a machine tool, which will affect the accuracy of a machine overall and affect how it performs um, and the quality that it produces. And then you have wear. Machines will naturally wear over time and parts will need to be replaced. But how to monitor that wear, control that wear to prolong the life of certain components is a challenge. And they're the challenges that we face in this project here. And in doing so, we brought in IoT and data analytics combined to get the data from the machine and then start applying a level of analytics to the data that we're getting from the machine to get into this predictive scenario so we can support companies to identify why they might see variances in their processes and failures in their process. For CNC machining, we were working with Donlock and we looked at the cutting tool spindle. Cutting tool spindles on CNC machines are very finely balanced. They run up to 20,000 RPM, but they're easily prone to damage. They're very expensive to repair. A typical spindle can run anywhere between 20 and 40,000 euros easily. And it could be long lead times. A machine could typically be down if it's unannounced, could be down for two weeks. If you knew that the spindle was going to fail or was imminently about to fail, you could order the replacement parts in advance and have them sitting on your factory floor and then downtime could only be one day. So this is the space we want to get into. The influencing factors on CNC spindles are spindle imbalance itself, thermal growth, temperature changes causing problems, operator errors, people making a mistake, giving a machine a knock, uh, they bang the spindle and then it's not right. Uh, sustained vibration through poor tool holders, if you have poor quality tool holder or cutting conditions, you can get sustained vibration over a long period of time, which imminently will lead to spindle failure. Um, and being able to monitor that that uh, that prolonged impact on the spindle and being able to report on it is, will lead to a predictive situation. Um, and then poor programming and machining strategies, being able to identify if poor programming strategies or machining strategies or work holding are causing problems on your machine tool. So the approach we took here was to monitor the spindle through temperature and vibration analysis and then acquire the machine data and then correlate the data between these. Now, spindle monitoring through vibration and temperature is readily available. It is um, um, a commercially available product. However, to correlate the data with everything that's going on in the machine around it and um, to understand that is the approach that we've taken in this. For injection molding, we worked with key plastics and molding process, again, is very complex. And even when I got into the project, I wasn't aware of how complicated it was, but you've got clamping pressures, clamping pressure build up time, worn mold plates, worn pumps, worn motors, inconsistent heat generation, inconsistent sprue pressure, varying material competitions, uh, composition. Again, a number of things that influence the quality of the program of the, the uh, of the product. And remember, we're talking about microns here. Like ten microns is a tolerance that these machines are trying to work with, work with in. So different, like a small wear in a hydraulic pump can affect this overall output. So the approach here was to monitor the hydraulic system through temperature and vibration again, and also monitor the temperature of the. The, the sprue chamber and the, the, the melting process as well, and acquire the machine data and correlate the data from the machine with additional sensors that we put onto the machine and identify at what times under what situations are we seeing and absorbing different things. And with that, then I'll hand you over to Dermot, our IoT um, expert, to go through how we got the data from the machine. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So uh, in the IoT team, I guess our job starts with gaining an understanding of the data requirements. So, you know, what information needs to be captured? How do we capture it? You know, what software develop in order to achieve those goals? So for a project like DDMS, this would initially involve a site survey where we take a look at the local environment, build out a site of uh, a set of site specific recommendations. So the, the overall aim being to maximize the quality of the data through sensor positioning while minimizing any disruption or impact from a, a safety or an equipment operation perspective. So we typically, you know, we review the site, we take into account physical factors such as location of power outlets, uh, network ports if needed. We determine the physical sensor requirements. So, you know, cable routing from our data acquisition unit to the point of 
data capture must be planned and agreed with the with the tool owners. Uh, we need to ensure that the, the sensors can meet the data acquisition requirements. So although that might sound obvious, you know, the, the sensors being deployed must be capable of operating within their designated environment and be capable of providing data at required accuracy, resolution, and, and the frequencies as well. So that the choice of sensor is critical too. So um, often the install might require some additional work in terms of provisioning, maybe wall mounting brackets to, to house our, our data acquisition box, maybe even provisioning new power outlets or cable routes if there are no alternatives. So all that work must be agreed and planned. Um, I guess re remote access and data streaming capabilities also need to be determined during the site survey. So remote access is, is highly desirable in terms of being able to, uh, for us to be able to help check the hardware and confirm that data is being gathered successfully over a long period of time uh, or troubleshoot any, uh, troubleshoot any issues remotely or, you know, we're, we're generally trying to avoid the overhead of a site visit. I, I guess uh, system integration has traditionally been a big challenge within, within the world of industrial IoT. So you know, for us dealing with tried and trusted solutions that would be favored in a production environment because of their reliability, uh, well, that often means that we'd encounter you know, legacy hardware and software that may be either end of life or end of support or maybe very tailored communication protocols that are developed for very specific tasks. For example, Euromap 63 is, is, is a communication protocol that would be used exclusively with the, the injection molding machines that, that Chris was talking about earlier. So these elements might have a reduced uh, support structure, you know, whether it's within the IoT community, from, from vendors themselves, or even from a, a software availability perspective. So uh, there might be minor constraints. So for example, the, the FANUC focus library that we would use to communicate with the, uh, with the FANUC uh, milling or, or lades, uh, they, they can only be used within the Windows environment. So, uh, you know, the, the, that's an example of a minor constraint. More often, potentially more significant challenges in terms of discovering machine specific information, which is key to retrieving data, uh, would be encountered as well. So. Uh, again, remote access is a key consideration. So, you know, in order to monitor and maintain our, our, our data acquisition boxes for DDMS, we, we utilize dedicated 4G modems, which we deploy with our hardware. That allows us to establish remote console connectivity. Um, it also, it enables us to update code if necessary, or to take data snapshots remotely in cases where we're unable to stream data directly to our IMR servers. Uh, you know, whether, whether, whether that's due to network or, or, or site policies or just lack of supporting infrastructure, it's, it's, uh, it could be any of those things. So uh, I guess one of the, the key capabilities that we're continuing to develop uh, in the IoT team in IMR is our IoT toolkit, which utilizes a variety of, of in-house protocol connectors, we call them. So the, these are software components that, that allow data coming from multiple different sources, such as, you know, whether it's Modbus, uh, OPC UA, wireless communication, um, or even, you know, uh, protocols like BACnet, if we're interfacing with a BMS or something like that. They, they, all those data sources can be delivered as a standardized payload to a backend platform. So for projects like DDMS, uh, we're able to reuse some of our existing connectors, like for example, Modbus, we would have used for vibration sensors. Uh, so that enables us to quickly develop and implement solutions. You know, other connectors such as more vendor specific uh, FANUC or you know, communication protocols like Euromap 63, uh, we would develop as required. So our, our suite of connectors is continually being expanded and designed for reuse as well. So we'd also use, an, you know, we, we tend to adhere to industry standard protocols such as you know, message brokers for facilitating data being sent in a secure way from, from these different data sources um, to a dedicated, a dedicated data collector. And, and I, that can also be forwarded to our, our own IoT platform for, for data visualization purposes. So uh, I guess back with DDMS, the, uh, the, we, we also have an onboard analytics engine which calculates OEE uh, based on equipment execution and idle times, which, which are derived directly from machine controller data and and known shift times as well. So, um, so yeah, like I say, for DDMS, the, the equipment that we deploy is, is typically self-contained. So it doesn't require any additional supporting infrastructure other than really a, a single 220 volt power supply. 
uh, the boxes themselves, like you can see on the, on the left-hand side there, they're, they're robust enough to operate in industrial environments where we might encounter high temperatures, vibrations, potential power interruptions. So each component must be capable of automatically re-establishing connectivity to our data collecting the event of a power outage. Uh, again, obviously with, with, with remote access, we need to ensure that we have a good cell signal for our, our 4G modem. So, um, we'd potentially stream data directly to remote instances of our platform, depending on, on site access and network policies, uh, which we've done in other projects, um, or just perform remote data snapshots, uh, snapshots, which we do with DDMS, which we then pass on to the analytics team to use. So uh, I guess our, our, our partners at, at Don Lock and Key Plastics, they would see the value in, in real-time data visualization. So our IoT platform provides Bespoke dashboards, as you can see on the right-hand side here, and I think Chris already mentioned the various data points that we're interested in visualize, uh, visualizing, like you know the, the OE spindle data, vibration data, tool data. Um, so again, on, on the left-hand side, you see an example of a data acquisition box with the various components there. I mean, typically we'd have you know a, a network switch that would enable all of our components to talk to each other locally. Um, on the bottom left, you can see. Um, in, uh, the, in the middle of the box there, the, the, the controller for the vibration sensor. And to the left, we have two mini PCs which provide the, the processing power basically for, for data acquisition, database storage, and our data visualization capabilities. So uh, that's it in a nutshell, basically. That's it from the, the IT side. So I'd uh, pass you on to Anthony now from the, the analytics team to take it to the next step. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Demo. Yeah. So. I will uh, 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 present the data analytics perspective on, on, on this particular project. Now, for the data analytics part uh, in the DTMS project, the focus has been to transform data that we are receiving into insight in a quest for providing data-driven maintenance uh, services. Uh, to this case, we are interested on three levels of insights. One, uh, insight that would provide a clear understanding of machine uh, states and processes, uh, like what Chris has said before. But two, inside that would enable us to do root cause analysis, understanding uh, why things have happened. And number three, uh, inside that would allow us to detect and predict a failure ahead of time. This is very important for us to be able to uh, know what has happened, uh, why this happened, and if possible, uh, try to predict when things will happen. Now, to achieve this as part of the DDMS project, we have developed a data analytics pipeline and dashboard uh, that would enable both domain and data scientist experts to be part of the data analysis uh, loop. And this is very important because we believe that, okay, uh, for us to be able to, uh, to, 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 to see value from the data, we need to learn from the domain experts and then try to encode this domain knowledge as part of the data analysis uh, process. So the platform that has been, as I said, the platform that we are, we are developing, of course, is following a, a four a incremental a stage that in aim at integrating a domain experts and data analytics knowledge. And the first uh, stage is the data management platform, which is very important because it provides data integration, data integration, transformation, a storage, and backup, which of course, which feed these into the other three components, uh, the other three components. But also it's also provide companies uh, with the mechanism to be able to integrate this data into their uh, platform very uh, easily. The second uh, component is the uh, comprehensive and interactive visualization. So in this case, we are providing continuous and interactive data visualization uh, to help us visualize key machines and process parameter with aim to gain deep understanding and insight into machine states and production process over time. And to most extent, this is the part of the dashboard that uh, Chris will, uh, will go through to show you what, how are we using this to help us drive this insight. And number three is the data analysis uh, that focus at incorporating our domain knowledge, aiming at finding a pattern, identifying anomalies, providing uh, immediate warning based on simple rules and statistical uh, analysis. And the last stage that, will be work that we are working on now is applying advanced data analytics based on machine learning to automate the expert knowledge 
knowledge and insight that were already derived from the previous stage. We aim to minimize human intervention in the analysis step, but also provide predictive um, maintenance uh, and, and error warning with high accuracy and automate uh, the root cause identification and mitigation. So in this slide, I will uh, show you uh, or say the, the, the two aspects of visualizations that we are providing. We are providing visualization of uh, interactive, uh, visual, interactive visualization of the historical recorded data and the uh, reports or uh, summary of key process parameter and production performance. And this visualization, as I said before, is interactive in a sense that it allow whoever interacting with the dashboard to zoom in or zoom down or go to a specific point and try to understand uh, what has happened in that particular aspect. For instance, this is the snapshot of the uh, spine of vibration from the uh, download uh, use case, which we observe for a particular time. And this is the uh, param uh, performance parameter with the feed alert overlights. And this is the snapshot of the uh, uh, perf production performance uh, of a specific period of months that we have already collected. Now, the analysis that we are doing, we are doing, uh, currently we are doing a three level of analysis. One, uh, doing analyzing the vibration is aimed to identify anomalies and establish root cause analysis. But also we are doing safety diagnosis circle and a program has check analysis that aim at uh, monitoring the machine has score condition where we analyze and compare vibration signature for different uh, program to check the repeatability of the program if the program is still the same uh, for, for, this, for, 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 for the duration of time that we are learning the machine. But also we are identifying pattern correlation uh, between observed, observed parameters and production quality with that aiming at identifying uh, aim at monitoring the production uh, quality of the machine. So in this uh, figure here, we summarize just some of the analysis that we are doing as part of the uh, uh, safe diagonal sequence analysis and anomaly uh, identification using machine learning uh, approach. Now I will hand this to uh, Chris, which uh, will uh, take us through how we use this uh, dashboard uh, and pipeline to help us gain insight from the data we're receiving from download and keep plastic. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go into some uh, details around um, some of the uh, reports and some of the images that were some of the reports that we found and some of the analytics that we've been able to apply to it. So this graph here, we can see this is vibration uh, summary um, over a period from June to September from a machine spindle. And you can see two anomalies clearly that stuck up for two periods. And while you can use uh, vibration signatures to monitor anomalies, but we were able to identify what time, what program, what tool number, what load, what spindle speed happened at those exact times. And when we showed this to the companies, it was very, very interesting and exciting because everybody knows the CMC machines can get bumps, can get knocks, but they were not aware of these two incidents, for one. And two, were they, was the machine the same after? Was there any issue with the machine after? Was it performing just as good before as it was after? And we've been able to analyze that as well with them and tell them that actually, even though it did get a knock, there was no difference between the day before and the day after. And how did we do that? Well, I'll show you in a second as well. A second thing that we did here was we analyzed the, the tools over that three or four month period. And this is ongoing at the moment. And we've been able to identify the tools which caused the highest spike or incidents like we've seen a second ago. But more importantly, we're able to identify what tools had a prolonged amount of vibration over that three or four month period. And in this one here, we can see that tool number 40 has the highest amount of vibration over that duration. So we have spoke with Don Lock, we've queried what tool number 40 is, what's happening at that time, what's causing that vibration, that sustained level of vibration. And they've been able to tell us a number of things. Interestingly, we would expect from machining knowledge is that when you're machining heavier materials, generally you get higher vibrations with harder materials, bigger face mills, this kind of stuff. However, we're finding that smaller tools running at higher RPMs are actually causing more prolonged vibration. Um, so tools running at 18 or 20,000 RPM, we're seeing more signature vibration in the machine tool than we are with a 50 millimeter face mill machining and stainless steel. We took two programs, or we created a program with Donlock, a warm up program. Typically, most CNC machines have a warm up program, and we use that as a baseline because we know it's very repeatable. It's using one tool 
and it's run most days on the machine. The one on the left we can see is a warm-up program from the 18th to the 6th, and then the one on the right is from the 30th to the 9th. Very, very little difference between the two of them. We've been able to take this ongoing every day, a snapshot when they run their warm-up program. And if we go back to the anomalies or the spikes from a couple of seconds ago, we've been able to compare before and after to check that the health of the spindle is still good. We can also, an observation following this was, well, if can we actually deploy this for monitoring a vibration signature for a whole part, not just a warm-up program? If we have a component that we're machining, we've been able to monitor the vibration signature of a part that they've made three weeks ago. And then again, they set it back up on their machine today and we've been able to monitor it and compare the two of them and see if there's a difference and what parts of the program are different. Is there a different tool holder? Was there a different cutting tool? In theory, the two of them should be exactly the same unless some part of the process is changing or failing. Mapping this vibration from the warm-up programming as well has allowed us to trend to see is the machine staying good, the spindle staying good all of the time, or is it progressively getting more and more vibration? It's a very, very good baseline for us. A side note on this, as Derma said earlier, and Anthony as well, was OEE. Once we're capturing all the data from the machine, being able to just leverage it to anal analyze the level of OEE is quite easy. We know the shift, we know the runtime, we're able to catch the spindle on and off time. But this is taken directly from spindle runtime. It's not green button, it's nothing got to do with any other parameters. It's pure spindle runtime, which is very important for companies. When we move into the molding side of things, we keep asking, we've only begun to scratch the surface of the data from their machines. We haven't got to the level of analysis yet as we have with the CMC machines, but we're definitely anticipating that we're going to find anomalies, we're going to find changes, we're going to be able to do batch to batch comparison with the overall data from their machine. We're identifying what target areas we really want to hone in now. Um, the top one that we have here is vibration sensors from a the hydraulic system that they have. The bottom one there is temperature sensors from the heat chamber that they have in the molding machine. So we're getting this data live at the moment and we'll start applying a level of analytics to this over the next few weeks. So the next steps, analysis from the CNC machine has been given a lot more insights than we envisaged. Every time we look at the data with Donlock, we're like asking more and more questions. What about this? Can we try that? What does that look like? What about this tool? Should we balance tool holders? Should we do this? And all of that is opening up conversations to help prolong the life of the machine and predict what's going to occur in the future. Exactly enough historical data to start predicting future situations and we're targeting areas of the process we will modify. So I mentioned tool number 40, uh, causing that level of vibration for a long, prolonged period of time. We're going to probably see if we can change that tool or balance that tool holder and see, does that reduce that tool? What's going on with that tool? And the benefit here is we'll be able to mon mon monitor the impact straight away. If they change something in the process, the next day we'll be able to tell them, actually, yes, something has happened here. Something has changed here. Mm -hmm.